Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Juliana Hever. Welcome, Julie. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank Juliana. You, I'm so happy to be here. Yes, call me Jules. Call me anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's my niece's name. That's easy to remember. Um, okay, so you're here to talk about plant-based diets, but I want to get the elephant out of the room and ask, because people are always curious, is it the same as vegan? Yes, that's a, it's a great question. And so in my very first book, so in like 2010, when I started writing about this or before, I dubbed it very clearly as a vegan diet is an exclusive definition. It means I don't eat animal products. Okay. But a plant-based diet, or I like to say a whole food plant-based diet, that means it's an inclusive definition. It means I eat a diet based on whole plants. So I really am all about inclusion versus like making people feel like it has to be this way. It has to be perfect. I'm very anti-perfection. And yeah. so I really like saying plant-based, eat more plants. It's a very gentle, loving, that's where all the science is anyway. You don't have to be vegan to be healthy. And there's a lot of unhealthy vegans and I'm a dietitian. So I'm not an ethicist or a moralist. I'm here to like help you eat more plants to have optimal health span. Okay. Yeah. Cause there is a stigma. And anytime you tell people, like I'm Catholic. So, you know, you can't have meat on Fridays during Lent. And then that's all you want. You just crave a cheeseburger. So if people are like <laughs> told you have to, you can't, you know, whatever, immediately it's either a turnoff, they're not interested at all, or they just think of all the things that they can't have instead of the plethora of all the vegetables, all the plants, there's millions of things you can eat, but that's all I we love focus that, on. Don. Yeah. I love that. And that's like you said, the elephant in the room is like, don't think of a pink elephant. And then that's all you can think about. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's absolutely true. And there, there are, and I don't like to think of telling people what they can't ever can't or shouldn't do, but more like, Ooh, what are ways to make this delicious? And you could do it this way. And what else can you eat? And what are some new foods that you could love and enjoy and learn to just, you know, change your, change your repertoire, add to your repertoire and right. it should definitely be a positive journey always. And it's never about, there's no such thing as literally, there's no such thing as a perfect diet period. There's, it doesn't exist. So there's that, that sense of ease. When yeah. You Cause there it. is so, so much out there information overload Ugh. and, and every expert, and this is no offense, but every expert that any lay person like myself hears, it makes you even more confused. You know, you hear like, oh, coffee's terrible. Don't drink coffee. And then the next year, oh, it's good for your heart. And, and it's just, it seems like it's always something different all the time. And then people feel lost and they don't totally. know where, where, where they should start. And not only are the lay person getting lost, it's the researchers and healthcare practitioners are also lost. So what's a person to do? Because then it trickles down into the media and then it trickles out. And now, you know, everybody eats. So everybody's an expert on what you should eat, <laughs> you know, a self-proclaimed right. expert. So I find, I always call myself a nutrition myth debunker because what I like to do is look at, if you look really the long run, like what stayed the course, what is information that we've known for centuries or at least decades and decades, at least a hundred years, we've been documenting a ton of science on nutrition mm -hmm. and the real fundamental truths don't go away. Right. You know, fads come and go all day long, but the truths stick and they're very like, you, you can't unseat the evidence on certain things. Like we know that fruits and vegetables, very healthy, healthy thing you could eat. No yeah. one could... People try to like say that, but when you hear something like don't eat vegetables, you you know that there's not, this is like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> don't listen to that person, you know? Right, right. There are certain seeds that stay the course of time and then they get triangulated with data and build, 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 build. And that's what I like to rest my, you know, guidelines on. And I think that that's a real practical approach for someone that's trying to interpret the data. Like mm -hmm. if someone's telling you, you know, berries are going to kill you or beans are going to kill you, like question that person. And right. you know, yeah, you don't have to go very much further than that. Um, and then I don't know, taste aside, whether you think it tastes gross or whatever, are the, are the fake meats, the impossible beef burger or whatever stuff like that? Is it good or is it bad for people to, to use that kind of stuff to transition into, uh, more of a plant-based diet? So I love the way you framed this question. And, you know, I, I never would have predicted because I've been doing this for almost 20 years. I've been teaching plant-based nutrition for almost 20 years and plant-based wasn't a thing. I was the first plant-based dietitian. It wasn't even a thing. Like people are like, what's oh. that mean? Like I have been defining it for it all, but now everyone knows that it is. Yeah. So it's great that it's out there. That was kind of the intention, right? However, 
I did not predict what was going to unfold with all of these products. Like, of course, the marketplace always follows and catches up. But my goodness, like the fact that there's burgers, like anything you could eat, you could now eat plant based. And I'm now seeing, well, it's been about almost 10 years now that I've been seeing because of the onslaught of these products, vegans, elite, like people that have been vegan for years, which the evidence was like, un, like undeniably healthy, right? Until now, because now you could eat all that candy, cookie, burgers, blah, blah, whatever you want. That's not healthy. And whenever I look at these people that have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you know, these clients that come to me like, I don't understand, I'm vegan. <laughs> and as as I look at their food journal, boom, those are dominating in their thing. But what you just said is really important too. So when you're eating a diet based on that stuff, not healthy. No, you mm -hmm. need to eat a diet based on vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices in infinite tasty combinations, whole foods. That's where the health comes in. But transition, fabulous. Or treat foods, fabulous. It's great to have treat foods. And again, like how like mix it up a little bit, but those are not your staple health foods. You want to stick to those staple wholesome foods. That's where you're going to get the health benefits of eating a plant-based diet. Yeah. Cause I think that's where people get lost. Cause they justify it by saying, well, it's doesn't have meat and it doesn't have dairy like this. Right. Is, and it's better uh, and it's better, but it's the question I love to ask, and it's not asked often enough is compared to what? Yeah. So compared to a cheeseburger, a Beyond Burger, an old what an impossible burger, the veggie burger that's it's better. It still yeah. has saturated fat, but it doesn't have hormones. You know, there's definitely better. But compared to a bean chili, bean chili is way better. You know, yeah. so it's like you have to frame it with what are we comparing it to? Nothing's good or bad in um, isolation. Right, right. So how do you eat? Like, do you um, splurge or do you, are you strict? Oh, I totally am normal. <laughs> I'm like so human. <laughs> it's so funny. Me and my boyfriend were eating ice cream, last vegan ice cream last night. And I'm like, yeah. oh, I can do this once in a while. And it was delicious. And so yeah. today I'm back. But I don't do that very often. I eat, I eat, I love healthy food. I've really transitioned my diet to eating. Like it's been a long time, a long journey. It took me years and decades to get to eating this way, but like 20 years of eating this way, my whole health changed 20 years ago. And I love it. Like I crave, I can't wait for my, my, you know, nacho cheese salad that I'm going to have after we hang up. Like I love to eat, like you just have to find delicious foods. So I eat really healthy. I eat in a time restricted window. I usually eat two meals a day, sometimes one, but usually two. And I eat really delicious, healthy food. And then once in a while I have vegan ice cream or I make these <laughs> Also plant-based chocolate chip cookies that I'm obsessed with. They're always in my house and we eat those too. <laughs> yeah, I have like 10 questions. I want to find out what brought you to this point, but the question that oh, I always hear all the time, and I'm sure you hate it. How do you get your protein? You know, because people think oh. that it's like impossible if you're not eating a cow. <laughs> Oh my, God. oh my gosh, this is the myth. I call it the P word and no, this will not die. This myth of <laughs> protein. Forget about eating a plant-based diet. People are, I call it the persistent pursuit of protein. People are crazy. And I think, and I was like, I, I taught, I lecture a lot about this stuff all the time. And I'm always yeah. asked this question every single time. Yeah. So I'm glad you asked because I want to answer this question. It's not that I don't, it's just, I can't believe it's so persistent. And I can't believe I think it's social media. And I think all these, like the, the reels and these self-proclaimed experts now, it's like right. protein mania as if, okay. So in 20 years as a dietitian, I've only seen a protein deficiency half a time. And it was because of a too low of calorie or eating processed foods. You can't have, people don't have protein deficiencies. It doesn't happen. People why, are like, why do people think that though? They think like, um, especially women or is it menopausal women? I'm trying to remember why it came on my feed because I'm menopausal, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. it was something about how you have to absolutely take in way more protein, like double of what your weight no, is or no. something. Right. Oh my okay. gosh. No, I know it's so bad. It's when you hit 65, adults that hit 65, you need to go from literally 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram, not pound. So oh. 2.2 divided a day to one gram per kilogram a day. That's the difference. 0.2 grams. Per, so basically 50 grams of protein is almost too much. That's nothing. But wow. here you got these people pushing 50 grams at each meal. Look at how I get hundred grams of protein. Yes. In my protein meals, protein, this protein, water, protein, 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 protein. And like, 
why, why? So no, there's no such thing as a protein deficiency if you're eating adequate calories and you're getting it from whole foods. Now, if you're eating refined sugars and flours and cakes and cookies and you're basing your diet on that, you're not only going to have a protein deficiency potentially, you're also going to have all sorts of other problems. But right. protein is the dominant one. Like we don't wash, there's not a lot of people walking around in the Western world with quash your core. I've never seen quash your core in, in the Western <laughs> world, you know, ever. That's like a severe protein deficiency. But I don't even see it even mildly in my clients. Like I, I've reviewed thousands of labs and I've wow. worked with thousands of people, you know, That's and I've amazing. helped thousands of people lose thousands of pounds and get healthy and get off medications. Never was it because of a protein deficiency. People are pursuing protein. And here's the problem, the main problem, I'll tell you. When you're pursuing protein, like what do you think of when I say eat protein? What does that just bring to mind? Like having a steak, just sitting and yeah. having a steak, <laughs> like a really big steak. <laughs> Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. But it's so funny because protein is a macronutrient. You know where protein starts from? Plants. All plants have all the amino acids. Now, the packaging matters. So if you take, let's say 33 grams, I've got a graph that has this. Let's say the same amounts of protein in a mix of animal foods versus a mix of plant foods. Okay. So animal-based protein and plant-based protein, same exact gram per gram. Okay. In the animals protein, you've got packaged saturated fat. We know that causes cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes. It, it's got IGF, it boosts IGF one, your hormones causes cancer. Mm -hmm. It boosts that in your bloodstream. Okay. It causes aging. So all that is, is from the meat itself. There's heme iron, which is a pro oxidative type of iron and we need iron, but we don't need that pro oxidative version of it. It's got new 5GC. And when you cook meat, because who wants to eat raw meat? Because food poisoning is not fun. Right. Those cooked, the things that come out, the compounds that come out when you cook it, <clears throat> excuse me, ages, heterocyclic amines, polycyclic, there's these hydrocarbons, these things that come out when you cook it that also promote cancer, right. inflammation, aging, all of the things we don't want. So that's packaged with the meat. What else is missing from the meat? The two most important nutrients, fiber and phytochemicals. Okay. Now we go back to the plants. Okay, plants, same amount of protein packaged with not only tons of fiber, phytonutrients that are antioxidative, anti-inflammatory, you know, health, healthy for mm -hmm. your bones, healthy for your heart, healthy for protect your body against everything. Okay, and zero of those things in the meat. So it's like, it's like, well, how do you want your package? You know, where do you right. want to get your protein from? Like, right. You know, the other thing is, if you look at the data, like mortality increases when you choose animal protein versus plant protein, you could decrease your mortality by swapping in plant sources of protein. You know what has protein? Broccoli has protein. Beans have protein, a lot of protein. Lentils have protein. Uh, lettuce has protein. I mean, it's like, it's ubiquitous. It's every plant has every amino acid. So how do you want your protein package is the real question that we need to ask more. Oh my gosh. I love that. Do you, okay. So then that's where I think of like fish because then they promote and say, you know, that fish is so good for you because it's got, you know, all the omegas and all that business. Do you ever eat fish or what would be good in comparison? Right. So there you go. And compared to what? So compared to meat and dairy, fish is great compared okay. to chicken. Fish is great because fish does have the omega-3 fatty acids, right? So it is, mm -hmm. it is. And it definitely has higher, better. So again, we're doing compared to what? Right. The question, but now the, the one thing that you just want to make sure you're aware of is you don't want to have fish all the time because right. it's better, definitely you want to choose that over meat, chicken, and mm -hmm. dairy. Dairy, I think it's the worst thing you can put in your body because it really raises your insulin growth like factor one and growth hormone, which causes cancer and everything. So dairy is the worst, but, and it's pro-inflammatory, but anyway, so choosing <laughs> fish over that is great. However, remember that our oceans have tragically become mm. our dumping ground. So now we have in our oceans, microplastics, nanoplastics, PCBs, dioxin, mercury, all these poisons that are mm. aggregating in our oceans. But the problem is we're not just, you know, drinking the water. We're like, these fish are living in the water and they're eating and they're eating smaller mm. fish that are eating this, that are, so they're, they, it's called bioconcentration and their flesh bioconcentrates these toxins. And then you eat a more concentrated version of it. So fish is better than meat is better than dairy, but it's better to get it from the lower on the food chain as much as possible. Again, perfection doesn't exist. Yeah. We're stratified in terms of what's better, what's worse. That's a helpful, you know, way to, 
think about it when you're making your choices. A hundred percent. I love it that you word it like that. Like, okay. And skip the steak. And if your only other option is to have fish, then have the fish or just have a plate of vegetables. My husband made fun of me one time when we went out to eat and I just ordered all sides and I got like a baked potato and <laughs> broccoli. And well, that's right. Yeah, Mom, that's exactly right. Eat the sides, but like, yeah, not about like, I have to choose between a steak and a vegetable. I don't want people to think that either. Like I make, Mm -hmm. I've, I've now published 10, nine books. I'm working my 10th book, nine books. And with lasagnas, excuse me, lasagnas and stews and Thai curries and Indian curries and, um, sushi and, you know, bowls, like hearty, delicious, amazing Reuben bowls. And I mean, there's so many delicious foods. It's not like I need to eat rabbit, you know, like a rabbit and eat (laughs) carrot sticks, or I could have this luscious steak because that's a terrible comparison for most people. Like no one wants to, who would choose that, right? Right. (laughs) Even me, who I'm like, I love vegetables. That sounds awful to me. Right, right. So do you have a garden? Do you grow all your veggies? I do unfortunately have a black thumb and I live in the middle of a very (laughs) industrial part of Los Angeles. So I've had points in my life when I've lived more, you know, suburban and I did try to grow, but like, I'm not very good at it, but I do go to farmer's markets and, but mostly, no, mostly I go to the regular old markets and I buy mostly chopped already because I'm very busy. So I just want to have it easy. Right. Like I don't want to make it complicated, but man, I love a fresh grown, oh my gosh, out of a garden. And I respect and admire yeah. people that could do it, but I, I, I really am not very good at that. I don't have the resources right now to do so. Right. Right. Um, so what I was getting to with that is, um, supplements because people say now that the soil is garbage and that it's not, doesn't have all the nutrients and the magnesium and everybody everybody's magnesium deficient, according to the internet, you know, so it's like, oh my gosh, do I need to take some, you know, supplements of magnesium all day long or what, like, do you take supplements? Are they necessary if you're eating a well-balanced, meaning fruits and vegetables, anti-inflammatory foods? Do you need all the pills? Such a great question. So there's so many problems with the supplement industry. So many, like it's not regulated. We don't know exactly what we're getting you know, every time consumer reports whips out one off of a shelf, it's never what it says is in there. It's either too much or too little or (laughs) so it's scary. It's buyer beware. It really is. You have to be really cautious. So, but that said, there is no such thing as a perfect diet. Like I said, so if you're eating a Western diet, you're deficient in folate, vitamin C fiber, the the traditionally, like you're deficient, a lot magnesium stuff, potassium, but if you're eating a plant-based diet, you have a risk for being deficient for sure in B12. That's the crucial issue. I do take B12 every day and I do take vitamin D3, but I'm, so I could talk about each individual, but I'll tell you, I take a multi with B12, D3, iodine, Mm -hmm. because people aren't eating iodized salt anymore. And goiters came back. I never thought I'd see that either. Really? Yeah. I've seen them. Um, and zinc. I do. I take those and all in a multi. And I, and I just try to take it like with the gentlest amounts. I know like just a really not too much because too much of anything is never, it's like, just cause something mm-hmm. good. It doesn't mean more is better. Protein right. is better. Um, but it's just like knowing how to have just a little bit, but for a plant-based diet or, or we're talking menopause, most of my clients are perimenopausal and I'm there too. So right in that, in that throes of deliciousness of, Yay. Of transitioning. <laughs> yeah, <woo-hoo. laughs> Ugh, It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, but any woman or any person, male or woman or anything over the age of 50 needs to supplement with B12 too, no matter how many steaks you're taking down, because we decrease our intrinsic factor in our stomach as we age and we can't even absorb B12 from st- meat anyway. So it's a really important nutrient for everyone to be aware of vitamin B12 is that's the big one. I'm always on a soapbox about, <laughs> do you believe in nutritional yeast? Oh, believe I love it. I what such is a it? What the heck is it? I put it on stuff. I even put it on popcorn. And my husband's like, why? And I'm like, I don't know. I just know it has B12. <laughs> it's so good. Okay. So I don't like the vitamins. I try to get the non-fortified, but it's more expensive. I it's called nooch affectionately, right? I use it in so many recipes. Like yeah. I make cheesy sauces out of it because it's got that cheesy flavor. It's basically a yeast grown on maple. So it's, okay. you know, it sounds gross because yeast, but ugh, but it's so yummy. And it's, yes, some it people is. don't like it, but some people grow to love it, but it's good on popcorn. I make it a lot of sauces. I sprinkle it on every, I could eat it on everything, but you do have to be careful because a lot of them have not only B12, but folic acid. And you don't want to be consuming folic acid as folic acid. You want to have it as folate, which comes from leafy green vegetables and beans. So okay, I, I do do too much of it anyway, but it's something to be aware of, try to limit it. When you're um, starting out and eating like this, 
if you have an adverse reaction, like, oh, I'm so bloated or whatever, does mm. your body just have to get used to, because like chickpeas, I feel like I have a really tough time with chickpeas, but I don't know if that's something that eventually I'll be able to consume them more regularly, or is it just your body saying, I don't like it? Okay, Dawn, this is, I love your questions. Okay, so this is a really <laughs> important question. Because have you heard of the blue zones? I know now there was a documentary, so everyone's heard of the blue zones. I've heard the term, but I don't know what any of that means. Okay, very briefly. It was uh, many years ago, this this researcher went out to find out the longest lived populations in the oh, world. Oh, yes, yes, here. yes, yes. Yes. So there were five locations around the world, only one in the United States in Loma Linda, which is right near me, because there's a Seventh Day Adventist population, and they eat most, like half of them are plant-based completely. So they are the longest lived populations. And what they did was they try to find the things and that they have in common so that right. we could you know, promote healthy lifestyle and have, have more centenarians. The only food all five had in common, legumes. So legumes are all the beans, peas, lentils, hummus should be a food group, and tofu and tempeh, different variations of that. But all five blue zones have that in common. It's a cornerstone for a healthy diet. You get your protein, everyone, their yeah. protein, at least the best way to get your protein. <laughs> So that said, yes. Now, anyone transitioning to eating more plants is going to feel it because you're going from no fiber to fiber. So mm -hmm. it's good to stepwise into all of this. You are going to have some discomfort for sure. Like that's like, there's no way around that. You're going to have mm -hmm. bloating. What's happening is your microbiome, which is, oh, it's like the key to your immune system and your health and your everything. And we're learning so much about the 10, what is it? 10 trillion organisms that live in our right. gut. Right. So you're repopulating it. You're when you're eating legumes and fiber, you're feeding it the good stuff that it need, the mm. good ones want. So then you're populating with the really more good bacteria, and then that gets rid of the pathogenic bacteria. Okay. So things are just shifting, and it's constantly evolving. It's not like it just changes. It's like always changing. So that said, here's what I tell my clients: if you're gonna first of all transition slowly, just more mm -hmm. more fiber, but be consistent. So just know that you're gonna have a few days or weeks where it's bloating and gassy mm -hmm. and that's okay. It's okay. Cause let your microbiome shift. It's good for you in the long run. It will get better. I promise it will get better. If you notice one specific thing, like, well, beans for, for a lot of people are really sensitive to them because it's so high in really good fibers. Right, right. So I tell people to start really small, like start with, I don't know, a quarter cup, but mm -hmm. have it every day and have it every day for, you know, and then until you could build up. Cause ultimately mm -hmm. you want to have like one to one and a half servings, uh, one and a half cups a day, ultimately, okay. but take your time. But if you still, if you're doing chickpeas every day, quarter cup, then you get to a half and it's still not getting better. Maybe chickpeas are just your extra sensitive and then move on to a different bean or legume. Yeah. Cause I feel like I can do fine with lentils. I do fine with all of that stuff. And then it's just, as soon as I have chickpeas, just not, yeah. no point. Bueno. And you could also try soaking them ahead of time oh. and adding a kombu. Like if you soak your beans, do you cook them from scratch? Um, No. Okay. Yeah. Me neither. Cause I, I love them when they're like that. They're delicious, but I don't, I just use the canned no salt added because right. I'm just so busy. I'm always looking for convenience, yeah. but um, that's fine too. But if you cook them from scratch, you could soak them overnight and then rinse them. And that gets rid of some of the oligosaccharides. Okay. I'll try that. Get, yeah. Why, why is that really about the salt? How come nobody's having iodized salt anymore? Oh, right. Okay. So, so we used that we had a problem with iodine deficiency a hundred years ago. It's been exactly a hundred years. I think we just celebrated the hundred anniversary of them adding iodine to salt because they were having goiters. People were having goiters and thyroid problems. So they iodized the salt. Well, now what's happening is people are eating fancy salt, like Himalayan. Himalayan. Salt. Yeah. Yeah. All these fancy salts. And also people are limiting salt because of their high blood pressure, which is good. You do want to limit your salt. Salt is a really big, it's the number one food cause of death believe it or not, salt. Uh -huh. I am so bad with salt. I yeah, we can talk about that. Salt. <laughs> let me I talk, love let's it. talk about that. I know, of course you do, because it makes everything taste better. <laughs> let's talk about that. But let me finish on iodine because <clears throat> I don't want to lose that because that's important too. So people are eating fancy salts and they're limiting their salt. And so they're not having iodine. It's really hard to get iodine unless you're eating fish. It's so, and you need, you don't want too much to, you want to, adults need 150 micrograms a day. You don't want too much or too little. So it's kind of hard to, one of those harder ones Balance. to regulate. Right. Salt. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> it's important. Here's the cool thing about salt. Have you ever transitioned from like Coke to Diet Coke or from milk, whole milk to nonfat milk? Have you ever done right. that? Yes, I have. 
And it, at first, like you go from whole milk to non fat milk and it tastes like water. Right. Slowly, slowly it starts to get creamier and creamier. Or, or diet soda or all of a sudden starts to get sweeter and okay and better and better. Right. Same with salt. So now again, I told you, I've worked with thousands of clients over like, you know, 20 years and everyone's the same and myself included. I've gone through this too. So I could really, I could empathize. Your palate shifts and you okay. will start the last, if you could just, it's, you could do it two ways. You can go cold tofu and just cut out all the high salty foods. This will be so good for a million other reasons because salt is usually packaged with all those ultra processed foods that are really unhealthy as well. Right. And if you salt at the, I'll, I'll give you the tip at the end, but, um, but it, so, if, so when you reduce it, so you can cold tofu, just not have it. And then it'll be awful. Like your food will be so bland. So you use lots of spices and herbs and stuff. And all of a sudden you'll start to taste the natural salt. Like celery is salty. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So you start to get more refined with your palate as you shed that. So, or you can stepwise into it. Either way, you really can shift your palate where it's not painful and you will, you will appreciate the fun. But also the other reason, like I do a lot of weight loss, like I do clients, uh, I work with clients that transition and lose 0.4 0.4 to 0.8 pounds a day of body fat, all the way up to 150 pounds. I've done many, many times with people. And with weight loss too, it's the same thing. It's this transition, right? It's, just, it's, just, it's taking this time and changing your palate, but you absolutely can change your palate. And it's extraordinary what how empowering that is. So what I tell people with the salt is that salt makes everything taste better so you eat more. So when we're going through this weight loss transition, oh. you want to eat more. You need to create a deficit to lose weight. So- that's another reason to kind of issue salt. But here's my tip on salt. One more thing is that, did you know that um, bread versus potato chips, gram for gram, have the same amount of salt? Oh my gosh, no way. Because the bread it's baked in, you don't taste it. But the salt the, on the chips is, there's oil in the chip and the potato, so the salt stays on the surface. So you taste it when it touches your tongue. So we could apply this when you're cooking and you could just apply a little bit of salt at the end not, you know, we boil, I don't know why they put it in boiled pasta and all these, you don't need to keep adding layers of salt because that sodium is going to affect your body, but you're not going to taste it. So oh, instead, okay. add it at the very end. That's so interesting. Uh, you talked about your, um, how you had the um, vegan ice cream and you uh -huh. said something about a window of, so do you do the fasting, intermittent fasting? So great question. So I, I do recommend time restricted eating. So here's the deal. We are in a constantly fed state. We wake up, we have coffee with creamer and sugar, start the day, a donut, a breakfast, a snack, a dinner, a lunch, all day long until right before we go to bed. And then remember, it takes four to six hours to complete digestion and absorption after your last swallow. So you're like well into the night and you wake up and start over again. Now the body thrives with time off from this process because mm -hmm. digestion and absorption is a very labor intensive process. And it like requires, that's why you can't go swimming after it. It just shunts everything to the gut. Your body needs to do all this metabolic house cleaning. It has so much work to do. And it's like, oh my gosh, we have to digest and absorb again. You know, like constant, constant, constant. Right. So if you look back at the literature from like, I don't know, Hippocrates days, like fasting has been a thing since the beginning of recorded time. And it's so healthy and you can reverse major problems with fasting, but who wants to fast, you know, and take out a week or two and just not eat and just have to be really rest and all that. Well, you get, it turns out a lot of the benefits or most of the benefits by spending time in the fasted state on a daily basis. So the, the research is kind of all over the place a little bit, but it's like 12 hours seems to be the minimum, mm -hmm. but it's easy. So you, you're not supposed to eat before you go to bed anyway, because you really want to have really good consolidation time and healing time while you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. So you give yourself three hours before you go to bed, boom, then you sleep, let's say you sleep, if you're lucky, eight hours, whatever, 11 hours, then you wait in the morning. Like, you know, I'm always right now, like I haven't eaten yet today. So to, when I'm in LA, so it's it's only barely whatever time it is, not 11 yet. I usually eat at 11. So then you all sip tea. I sip Americanos or coffee. Very healthy, by the way. You mentioned that at the beginning. Um, so much more evidence coming out about how great coffee is, which all the coffee lovers can rejoice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I sip calorie-free drinks all morning, water, sparkling water, all those things. And then I'm going to have my big meal at 11. And so then by that point, I've gotten about 18 hours without eating. I don't feel pain. So here's the hack for that. If you eat at the same time every day, you're not, you're only hungry at those times a day. Mm, amazing. Yeah. Your body, like your body resets or whatever. Gosh, yeah. the body knows what it's doing. We're the ones that interfere <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The body is brilliant. And we're trying to outsmart it. We can't possibly exactly. Right. Yeah. I, I can't imagine how frustrating it is for you with all of your knowledge about nutrition and stuff to get on the internet or watch TV and just hear all these 
well, probably dumb things that people say or question because when you don't, when you don't know, you don't know, but, right. um, yeah. So you wrote some for dummies books, which I love those books. Sorry, not the dummies, the idiots. Let's be clear. <laughs> <laughs> there are two different series and I'm, I did the idiots. The idiots. Okay. I didn't even yeah. realize there was, okay. So yeah, um, there's two different series. I know what what are your different books? I, I mean, I know the titles, but like, what did, are they all different themes? Are they, do you have recipe books? What are your books? Well, it's so funny because my very first book, I w it was, I was writing, my, this agent reached out to me. Would you want to write this book? And I was like, uh, yes, I've been waiting my whole life. My mom always told me I was going to write a book. I'm like, what am I going to write a book on? You know, so I was so excited, like dream opportunity. Well, here I am with two toddlers and I'm a full-time mom. Like I had no help. You know, my ex-husband was a doctor, full-time doctor. He commuted oh, three hours a day. God. I'm like, okay, here I've got two toddlers, but I'm not going to say no to this opportunity. I had six weeks to write an entire book. I had to code it. Like they had, it's a weird, the idiots guys have this like coding system that I had to learn in six weeks. And then oh, she throws in God. and I signed the client. I got the deal, everything. I was so excited. And my agent's like, oh, and 50 recipes. I'm <gasps> like, what? I'm like, I could talk about medicine, physiology, statistics, but like, I don't know how to cook. What are you talking about? I know food science, but I'm so, I will take a challenge and I will, I will not give yeah. up. I'm so competitive. So I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm on it. So in six weeks with my babies at 4 a.m., I'm like, type, 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 type. And then all day long, I'm playing in the kitchen and I figured it out. So it turned out that they think dietitians could cook. This is a myth out there. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to learn how to cook, but now I love cooking. It's become my happy place. So now, now all of my nine books so far are half concepts, theories, diets, plans, information, science. I'm very science geeky. And I then love that though. <laughs> well, if, cause it, people, people want proof. And yeah. if you have the scientific background and knowledge to back it up, then it seems more credible. You know, if you get somebody on there, that's like, looks like a 12 year old and they're sitting there telling you, you know, eat 10 steaks for breakfast. And it's like, well, how would you know what works for, you know? So I like the science geeky stuff, but so how old are your kids? They are now almost 19 and 17. Oh my gosh. How old Did, are your kids? Oh, Oh, they're adults. They're having kids. My <gasps> oldest is 20, going to be 29 next month. 27 no way. and 20, almost 26. Yeah. I, I cannot believe you could possibly have kids that look your age. <laughs> <laughs> the are the way you, the age you look. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. But yeah, I, I am kind of goofy in the way that I eat. Like I call myself a part-time vegan because I don't want to bother my mom. If she makes a home cooked meal and she is making like her spaghetti sauce, that's got the meat and all that stuff. I'm going to have it. Like you only live once. I am terrible when it comes to that kind of stuff, but otherwise I really try and stick to, you know, 85, 90% of the time I'm eating just lots of veggies, lots of fruit. And I love it. I do feel better for it, but I don't do the um, intermittent fasting. That's probably my next, my next thing to try. I wouldn't call it terrible. I think you're doing a great job. That's called balance. I think you've got a really good attitude and approach to it. And I, again, don't let perfection get in that way of thinking, oh, it's it, one time I have my mom's special sauce. Like, that's, <laughs> yeah, I just that's can't not. Of no, of course not. That's part right. of it. That's how you make this sustainable. I applaud you. Yeah. So what did you do your TED talk on? Oh, it was my, my coming out speech. It was very impassioned of, it was called, I called it breaking bread, but then I think they changed it to plant-based diet. And it was like why I went plant-based. I don't even remember the, it's been, it was 2012. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That was a long time ago. What, what did, what did make you go plant-based? Why did you do it? Well, mine was a journey of decades and it started when I was the long, okay. Try to make this as short as possible. Well, I'm not I, in a hurry. Okay. <laughs> oh, you want to eat. So yeah. You, <laughs> <laughs> you know me well already. No, I've got 24 minutes, but who's counting until I get to eat. <laughs> I really do stick to the schedule and then I'm not hungry. Good. It's really Cool, yeah, that's very but I did get hungry. Like this is this is when I start getting hungry. But yes, no, but that's okay. So when I my mom says I danced before I walked, like I was I loved dancing. You know, as a ballerina, as a little girl, I was five years old. So I'm in the I describe it as I was growing up in the you know ballet studio and my little leotard and tights. It was all you know. I was dancing every day. I loved it. And one day, I think I was about eleven. You know, you start to notice your body starts to shift a little. Yeah. Whatever. You don't really know what the heck that means at that time. Right. And. Miss Debbie called out from the record player across the room. I was standing there with my ballerina colleagues and she called out, Juliana, cut out your snacks. Oh, I know. And I'm like, what does that mean even? Like what? And I was How so- How old I just, were you? 
think I think 11 ish 10 oh 11 my god yeah I want the floor to swallow me whole Miss and Debbie so- is a b word <laughs> yes <laughs> If I ever, if ever Miss Debbie comes across, if I ever ran into her, I don't know what I would say. Well, she, you know, but you know what I didn't know is I didn't know what she meant, but I knew, I didn't also know that it was going to be the seed that planted the trajectory of my entire yeah, career yeah, I guess because I wanted to know everything there was to know about diet, nutrition, weight loss, body image, all. And I did, I set off on this journey to learn. And then I ran across this book because I was reading everything I could get my hands on, of course, before there was internet and everything. And there was a book in when I was about 16 called Diet for New America by John Robbins. It was the very first book to connect diet with health, the environment, and animals. And I had no idea. He's from John Robbins. John Robbins is Baskin Robbins' son. Oh. He was Baskin Robbins. And wow. he gave all that up because he saw how the animals were treated. And and what it did to, I mean, he's, it, the cool thing is later, I ended up getting to be executive director for or Save International, his organization. I got to work with him and collaborate with him. He's like, I mean, he's interviewed me. I've interviewed him and it's like such a dream come true because he changed oh. my life so profoundly. He's brilliant. But um, so anyway, wow. so I read that book and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be a, and my parents are like, you're going to be a veggie what? Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I don't know, but I don't want to eat animals right now. I don't even know what that means. And I don't know how to cook again. And yeah. so I tried it and then. I have what I like to call my intervention that my parents staged with our family friend, the nurse, and they took me to a steakhouse and ordered me a teriyaki steak with a pineapple ring on top. And Kendra proceeded to tell me how I was going to be deficient in iron and protein, blah, 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 all the things. And I didn't know, 16, like, okay. And so I was like, I remember eating that first bite of meat. And I always say like, you know, once you know, you can't unknow. But I went back to the normal diet because I grew up here in, you know, Los Angeles. Yeah. And, but I knew that there had to be more to the story. So I kept reading because I knew the vegetarians weren't dying off like flies. Like there had to be more. <laughs> I kept reading and kept reading. And then, then I was an actress because I'm in Los Angeles and everyone's an actress in Los Angeles. And I went to an arts <laughs> high school and I got, I was doing a lot of, um, you know, I, I, a lot of acting. And I ended up with a manager and agent and then going out in Hollywood, doing modeling and acting on that. And one day my, my manager called me and was like, Juliana, you got to cut out a few pounds for, you know, for the camera. I was like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> oh my so, god I know I know it was like a sign from you know the above that I needed to do this and it was okay so as I'm acting I'm like okay so she sent me to her personal trainer and I'd always like I, I have recordings tape recording uh tapes of me yeah. teaching aerobics to my sister and our friends like I love <laughs> exercise I was doing Jane <laughs> with my mom so I'm like okay this is fun I love this this is a great side career while I'm pursuing acting so I became a personal trainer as I was graduating from undergrad at UCLA loved personal training except everyone kept asking me right away well what do I eat I'm like well, I, I'm a personal trainer I don't know like I learned there was a chapter in a book and I've read a billion books but I didn't want to give information I knew how important this was I knew I had this like I needed to know so I enrolled I guess I wasn't done with school enrolled in graduate school became a registered dietitian and got my master's in nutrition it took me seven years because I was full-time trainer mom blah 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 loved nutrition, loved school for the first time, got straight A's for the first time. Cause I'm like, Oh my God, this is what I've always wanted to know. What are all the secrets? And yes. that was it. And then I was like, okay, so I finished that. Then I had my babies. It's like, well, when you have babies, what else are you going to do with your life? You have nothing to do. Right. Right. <laughs> so I dug back into the literature on the plant-based stuff and that was it. I did it. And my whole health transformed completely. Like things I'd struggled with my entire life were gone. And then like acne, I couldn't, I did everything for my skin, everything you can imagine as an actress, you know, it's like, it was important nothing could cure my horrible acne until I went plant-based gone stomach problems, sinus infections, my whole life gone, gone, gone. So I'm like, wow, I'm going to implement this with my clients. Then I kept seeing things that I was taught in grad school was not supposed to be possible where my clients were getting off medications. Like that's not what the role of the healthcare provider is mitigate the increasing progression of disease, not like stop it. Like, and this is 20 years ago now almost. And I can't believe how much I've witnessed. It's I'm no, never going back. I just want to shout this from the rooftops. And it's just been an incredible journey. Gosh, that was. <laughs> <laughs> There's your TED talk right there. No, that was, that's so, like you said, getting to see it, like the proof is in, in seeing people losing all the weight or clearing up, getting off of meds. That's huge. I remember you know a doctor telling me that um, I would be on meds for life for my thyroid and I was like, I don't want to be on meds for life. That's for, sorry, old people, but that's what I said. That's for old people to be on meds for the long haul. I did not want to do that. So I thought if I can tweak whatever I can diet wise and make myself feel better, then that's what I'm going to do. But 
Good for yeah. you. Yeah. Nobody wants that life sentence. That sounds terrible. I know it's true. It's tr- but but on the other hand, and again, having worked with a lot of people, a lot of people want the the quick fix. They don't want to have to transition their palate. They don't mm. want to like have to eat less salt or less cheeseburgers. And so they want the quick fix. So there is that paradigm that I'm always kind of working with. I stopped, I think it was like 15 years ago. I'm like, I I finally realized I'm beating my head against the wall. I'm not changing lives the way I want to. I'm not going to try to convince anyone ever, ever again. And I don't, I will never tell anyone what to do. If you really want this, I will love you all the way through. Yeah. But I'm never going to try to convince anyone to change their diet. They have to want it. I love that message because that's what people need. They need to know, like we said at the very beginning, that it's not restrictive eating. Just is this better than this? What's better than that? Like you like challenges. I love that because that's kind of what it is. It's like challenge accepted. I will make cheese out of cashews. Exactly. (laughs) Just what I'm having for lunch in 22 minutes. (laughs) Whatever it is. Okay, Juliana, tell people how they can find you if they want to look you up and uh, see what this is all about. Oh, thank you so much, Dawn. So I was plantbaseddietitian.com forever, but it's the same website, but now I'm shifting towards, now that plant-based has become a thing, now I'm shifting to healthspan messaging. So it's healthspandietitian.com, but you could also find me at plantbaseddietitian.com. It's the same website, but I'm really trying to refocus my messaging. Um, and so healthspandietitian.com. I'm on all the social media ch- channels and um, they could find me with my crazy spelled name or plant-based dietitian anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll put all that in the show notes too, so that they'll get the spelling right and everything. But how, what's your next book? When is it almost done? Is it- oh, thank you. No, not even close to almost done. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. I'm going back. I'm really, I'm taking my time with this one, but I'm going back. I'm, and I actually am still honing the it's, it's going to be more health span oriented. I had a book a couple books ago that was health span oriented, but I'm going to go into a different direction with that. So and to be determined. That's awesome though. Your mom thought you'd write one and here you are almost on number 10. So yes. yay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> go, well, it's been so awesome meeting you. I just love your energy and you're very inspiring. You have inspired me to not go put salt on my next meal. <laughs> Well, you're wonderful. I love your energy too. And I appreciate the conversation and I'm sure you can do it. It'll oh. change. It could change really easily. Thank you so much. All right. Well, you take care and go have lunch or okay, breakfast, whatever you call it. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Thanks, take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye.